Greetings, Edge Hill people. Reverend John Feldhacker here. This is April 25th, the fourth Sunday of Easter. It's official. Spring and the season of Easter is my favorite time of the year. There's so much beauty and energy and rebirth all around us. It really embodies the resurrection in perfect ways. If you have not yet had a chance to attend our Sunday morning class, please try to. You don't have to have read the book Christ in Crisis, but the conversation is really very good. But being able to reconnect with your fellow Edgehillians is turned into a highlight of most people's weeks. So the link was included in today's email. I hope we can see you Sunday morning. Now let's prepare our hearts and our minds for today's service. Join me for our unison call to worship. Shepherding God, bring us into your fold. Lead us beside still waters and restore our souls. Help us to see the way we should go, the way we should live. Help us to hear your voice calling our name. Enliven this time of worship that we may find true life as we join with others, praising your name, celebrating your great goodness, and sharing your love for all people.
Let us pray together. Shepherding God, be with us in our need. Like sheep who have gone astray, we have not heeded your voice, calling us to follow the right paths, beckoning us to lie down and be restored. We have acted as if our salvation lies in busyness and control. We do not want to be sheep dependent on a shepherd for everything. We want to do it alone, to maintain our independence. Forgive us for rejecting your shepherding care and your love and guidance. Forgive us for our need to do it by ourselves, to be separate from the flock. Forgive us for doubting your presence in times of trouble. Forgive us our despair in the face of unseemingly unrelenting evil and death. Lead us back to the path of life. Let us pray in silence. Amen. The peace of, the, of God be with you. Receive God's forgiveness and the promise of the Spirit, for Jesus is risen from the dead. Seen or unseen, he is present in our midst, and we see the presence of Christ reflected in each other's face.
let us pray. Loving God, for all things bright and beautiful, for all things dark and mysterious and lovely, for all things green and growing and strong, for all things weak and struggling to push life up through the rocky earth, for all human faces, hearts, minds, and hands which surround us, and for all non-human minds and hearts, paws and claws, fins and wings, for this life and the life of the world, for all that you've laid before us, O oh God, we lay our thankful hearts before you. In Christ's name, amen. The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He lets me rest in grassy meadows. 
He leads me to restful waters. He keeps me alive. He guides me in proper paths for the sake of his good name. Even when I walk through the darkest valley, I fear no danger because you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they protect me. You set a table for me right in front of my enemies. You bathe my head in oil. My cup is so full it spills over. Yes, goodness and faithful love will pursue me all the days of my life. And I will live in the Lord's house as long as I live. This is the word of God for the people of God. The Psalms were written to remind us of the safety and the joy we can have when we surrender to the God of love. But the words of the 23rd provides us an almost magical sense of peace and a sense of assurance of God's presence during the times of our greatest doubts and fears. The peaceful nature of this prayer and the simple images tell us how God travels with us through life's journey including both the deeply nourishing moments and our inevitable heartbreaks. The first verse serves to frame the rest of the psalm. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. When we are truly following God, we want for nothing. When we truly follow God, we're at peace and content in the little things that really matter, not the things that our culture tells us matter. And it liberates us from the great sense of entitlement and the insatiable wants of the, our materialistic culture. Who do you know in your life that truly wants for nothing anymore? Who do you know who is at peace and has a sense of complete fulfillment in the life that they already have? Our next verse plunges us into the atmosphere of beautiful freshness. The shepherd knows how to lead the flock to what it needs to live. Like each of us, the life of the flock depends on the unceasing movement forward into life. And the shepherd leads to places of nourishment. And to hungry sheep, nothing is more nourishing than a green pasture in calm, cool water. In this way, the shepherd leads the sheep onward each day to a new place and a new daily serving of the nourishment that's needed. You see, the resources are constantly renewed each day, every day, and all we have to do is to move forward and follow, and then be present to each and every God-given moment we experience. Because God's abundance means we no longer need to want more and more and more to be fulfilled in life. Next, in this beautiful psalm, the themes shift. In addition to the daily nourishment provided, the next verse warns of some very real dangers. And our reality is the shepherd can never remove all the dangers from the flock. But the shepherd does help the flock to pass through those dangers safely. Although all of our journeys will inevitably pass through the valley of the shadow of death, the dark places where death does not seem very far away. The only guarantee is that God will be there with us. The disappointments in life and the heartbreaks are still going to come. None of us is immune to suffering, and that's why these words of the 23rd Psalm have become so precious to so many people who turn to them over and over again at different stages of life. And this is important because God never promised that life was going to be fair or that if we're good enough or holy enough, suffering and illness and injury would just pass us by. One universal truth about pain, disappointment, and suffering is this. If you've never faced it, it's only because you have not yet lived long enough. However, God's promise is this. When we do face the pain and the unfairness of the world, as we all will, as we're all going to, 
will not have to face it alone. We have God and we have one another as channels of God's love when we most need to know that God is still there. And we need each other. We need each other when we're in so much pain we simply can't sense God's presence on our own. I've shared this with you before, but this is just such a good image, I needed to share it with you again. A number of years ago, a psychology professor at a major university conducted an experiment in pain tolerance. He invited several dozen students to measure how long they could keep a bare foot in a bucket of ice water. And one of the things he learned was that if there was someone else in a room with a person, that person could keep his or her foot in the ice bucket nearly twice as long. That's right. The presence of another caring person doubles the amount of pain someone can endure. Think about that. In the company of friends and loved one, pain is less painful. We hurt less when surrounded by friends and family. It's that simple. Our next verse is a little confusing, but it's become one of my favorite verses. It's, Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. This welcome, like God's grace, is overflowing. The meal is not just a quick snack to swallow and return to battle. This is an abundant banquet. God provides a true feast to be shared with all. It's a powerful image that connects us to what happens right here in this space at the end of every worship service where everyone has a place at this table. And when people gather around God's table, amazing things happen. We've all seen it. A more traditional interpretation of a table in front of our enemies Something that's been interpreted throughout the ages has been that a vindictive God rewards us and gives us preferential treatment while taunting our adversaries. This means that God not only prepares a banquet table for us, but does it so that our enemies can see it. And then we can say, look at us, we're God's favorite. But that's ridiculous because that's not how God works and that's not how mature Christians respond. Another interpretation of this single verse focuses on the Hebrew word that is translated as in the presence of mine enemies. And that Hebrew word or, um, ordinarily means simply opposite. So maybe this could mean, God, you prepare the table before me so that I may connect with people who are opposite from me on important issues. I like that image, that image of sharing a meal and entering into a relationship with people who oppose us, because that's how we grow, isn't it? It just makes so much more sense to me than a vindictive God. When we gather around a table with others and we share a meal, or especially when we share an abundant banquet prepared by God, lives and communities are transformed by God's grace. It's impossible to be at odds with someone when we gather around God's table and receive God's grace together. God's love is what changes all of us. Not just some of us, but all of us. But never changing us at the cost of others. It brings us together in communion of God's love despite our differences. It rarely means we see things the same way, but it always means everyone is changed as a result of the process. It's beautiful. And then the final verse, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. This might be the most important part of the Psalm. When bad things happen, the challenge is not to simply explain them or to justify them or to even accept them. The challenge when bad things happen is to simply survive them and go on living. And the key to surviving tragedy is in the realization that when bad things happen, God is on our side. And when we know God is with us and we are with God, the future no longer frightens us. So I invite you to surrender 
to the God of love and make the 23rd Psalm a way to a more fulfilling and joy-filled life for you and your friends and neighbors. Amen. I invite you to hear this benediction. Leave, go forth into the world aware of God's love and let the loving light of God shine on our lives and our actions and help us identify where we're living out of alignment with God, what, with what God would have us to do. Amen. Thank you.